worked out okay again. Okay, I know the class hasn't technically started yet, but I'm here early, some of you are here early, I'm recording this. If you have assignment questions, we'll talk about them now in the next 10 minutes. Otherwise, you can go on the board, there's office hours today, I will be hosting office hours today at 5. Um, and then Max has office hours on Wednesday, and then I have office hours on Thursday, as does Max. And Joe Cole has office hours on Friday. Yeah? Is there anything you need to do to that ball? free to share test cases on uh, Piazza. Don't be like, this is whatever. I mean, as long as it's not like, this is exactly what I did, and then this passed the, I did like this, and then I passed the test case. We're trying to keep some semblance of secrecy there, but otherwise I just give you the test case correctly. There we go. Multiple buttons. Um, so yeah, so I think that's super helpful um, to like make test cases, share it online, and be like, what? What does everyone else think this should be? Yeah. That would be. Would that be secure? That's a smart lock system, right? So how smart is it? Would it be smart for somebody else to be able to turn a key that somebody else put in the lock? So, what do you mean there is no key? I feel like this is a philosophical argument. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, for, say for instance, the very first command in the program is turn key. Okay. Before they actually insert key. Then that would like, what is it? Uh, so it's like a failure when you turn key. Mm. Because you can't put the key here? Yeah. fairly certain that never happens. I think either way you choose is fine. Of To just say error or say uh, uh, whatever this uh, failure username unable to turn key and have it be blank. Yeah. Any other questions or people who came up? Yeah. So we're saying that it's a smart lock system so it knows who initially inserted the key and it won't allow any other individual to come up and use that key that was previously Uh, the question was, it's a smart lock system. I guess maybe, I, well, it's really up to you, right, of how well you code this, but if we assume it's a smart-ish system, because it's got to figure out whatever the secret key stuff. Um, if a, like what should happen if a, whatever, the user that turns the key is not the same user that inserted a key. I'm looking at Max, too, to double check me on everything I'm saying, right? Yeah. So yes, they would. That would be. They should not be able to do it because they're not the person that put in the key. Yeah. So my question is about the firefighters. So would the command be input key or the name of the firefighter and then input key and then input key? Like what would the command be key? Yeah. So what is the? So then I to be annoying. So the question is about the firefighter key. So what does the spec here say? Uh, firefighters can enter with the secret key of the literal string firefighter secret key. So does it have any constraints about what the name of the person can be? No. So yeah, the, and this is where you can see, so actually a lot of buildings and places are like this, where there's like a master skeleton key, that if you have access to it, you have access to all of, actually, there's a great story, I think it was somewhere in New York, they posted a picture on uh, the newspaper of the master key of one of the things, and it was actually with enough detail that you could go create your own master skeleton key to get access to things. So, yeah, this is one of those things like a traditional key. If you know this secret, then you you get access regardless of anything. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. That story was the TSA master key. Was it the TSA master key? Just someone created them and started saying. There we go. Oh, okay, yeah. So this is, uh, I think, a different.
different story than what I was thinking. So these are the TSA, you know, anybody have a TSA lock on their luggage? Somebody? No, nobody has luggage or knows what luggage is. Um, okay, well if you have that lock, right, the whole point is that TSA can open it, but you can't. So these people actually, it was like, through pictures, were able to recreate the TSA locks to be able to open TSA locks. Cool. Anyways, uh, that's, any other assignment one questions? Yeah, in the back. You gotta shout. Yeah. Class hasn't technically started yet, so it's okay. So, if I just had a kid, and I turned to read all the first class, I assume that's all the goals to watch her all this. Like, you turn the key, you know, lock is now unlocked, right? You can pick out the name unlocked. It's the first cool room I've been in. Sure. I think at that point, you could still enter the house, right? Because it's like, the lock has been changed.
don't know, you can look through all the test cases and tell me. Okay. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, 10 minutes ago when we started, if you're just getting in, don't worry, all of that discussion was recorded. Um, if you want additional, and please take advantage of our time, we're here to help you through this assignment. It shouldn't be, uh, so it's not intended to be something insanely difficult, so we can help you think through things. Um, it is supposed to be slightly ambiguous, which I'll talk about in a second as to why. Um, and so please come to our office hours. We have office hours actually every day of the week. Um, if you cannot attend our office hours, let us know and we will work with you to find a time that works. Cool? All right. Now, so what are policies and what are mechanisms? Thinking about things, yeah. Yeah, so policies are like rules and mechanisms are maybe physical or technical things that we do. So what, so in our homework example, what's an example of a policy and what's an example of a mechanism? So how do I, so how do you know these policies about this house, or this smart lock house? It just come to you from the air, you woke up one morning and you knew everything about this house. Documentation. Was it? The document, documentation? So what was that? What was that documentation? How was that presented to you? PDF. Where'd you get a PDF? Wait, no, I'm talking specifically for the assignment. Yeah, from the website. In in what? How did, did it like download into a file into your brain? You had to read it. You had to read it with your eyeballs, yeah. or or read the screen reader. Um, and so, I mean, so but how was that policy expressed to you? <coughs> surprising corner cases, even in official documentation for things like IPv4 or TCP, all these things, right? So this is one way we can define policies. Is it the only way? Is natural language the only way we can define policies? No, what's another way then? You have to give me a proof, a counter example. I heard somebody over here. Let's go yeah. to so formal language, so what kind of, so can you give me, like what would an example be? Uh, like very general speaking, like you have a grammar or something. Okay. An alphabet or rules. So I need a grammar, I need an alphabet, I need uh, semantics of those rules, like exactly what those rules mean. So how would I express that? Yeah. I was going to say <laughs> illustration. Illustration, so that may be, uh, I don't know, is that yeah. not natural language? I mean, it's not a like, like, I guess, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. But at the core, you're expressing ideas. How is that different? So let's think about, um, so let's think about like a formal, what would be the most formal way of specifying something? Math, right? Is there any ambiguity in one plus one equals two? Yes, I see some head signs from math majors. <laughs> I didn't take enough math to back up that statement or not. <laughs> So what's the difference between math, or let's say formal notation, we could say, and uh, natural language? 
Does math have syntax and semantics like we were talking about? Yes, I'm sure you're, I'm 100% confident you've all taken enough math to realize that. Maybe you didn't know what to call it, of syntax and semantics, but now you do, you're a computer scientist. What else? Yeah. You have to raise your hand, so you're on the phone. So like procedural, there's a lot of rules. Yeah, could you express, like could I express what I wanted from this house in mathematical forms and no formalism? Yeah. Sure, but it's not going to be particularly legible to a human. So that's that's your main flaw here, is that while you get much more accuracy, it becomes exponentially difficult for, for a normal human to just look at it and go, oh, this is what you want. Yeah, so, so maybe I can express then the policy very precisely of exactly what I mean. And what other things can you do with like a formalism? How do we know that whatever one plus one equals two under some whatever domain of numbers or something? Proof. A proof? Would you want to do that on a security policy? No. You never want to prove something about a security policy. Like a discrete proof. Like a what? What kind of things would you want to prove about a security policy? Like you prove your proposition term just like a discrete proof of it. Like if this is open, then these are false, and this and this proves that my, my policy is affecting if people's door closed. Like, there you go. So you could prove maybe something about the policy, right? A high level intention of uh, whatever. You could prove that this policy says that uh, nobody but the owner can change the locks. Or you could prove that only somebody who had access to a key or was a firefighter could get access inside the house. Right? And you could prove that formally based on the specification. Um, have you taken 355 yet? Some of you? Is proving things easy? Does anybody remember trigonometry? I don't, but there's a lot of proofs there, right? Are they easy? You just like look at it and you're like, yep, I know that this thing is correct. Also, so when you're thinking about proving things, how do I specify that high level property I want out of this policy? How do I specify that um, nobody who does not have access to a key and who is not a firefighter or who doesn't know the firefighter's secret key can access the house? How do I have to specify that? What did I just specify that in? Yeah, sorry. So I'd have to use math, right? I'd have to use a formalism to describe the properties that I want, and then I'd have to use the mathematical formalism I have to describe the policy, and then I'd have to derive that this property follows from some set of mathematical formalism. Does that seem super awesome? Could you do that for this homework? Possibly, right? I think you could definitely make a good stab at it. Um, would you want to do that for something as complicated as the policy, like ASU's computer use policy? Have any of you ever looked at that? <laughs> that will change after this class, don't worry. <laughs> right? So why? What's the difference between the two? is or means in English? 
Also, if you want maybe end users to actually follow your policy correctly, if it's only ever written in formal notation, will they be able to understand what's, going, what they're, what's expected of them? What's better? Natural language. Natural language? Really? You sound like somebody who's either done with assignment one or hasn't started yet. <laughs> Any other opinions? This is not a right answer, by the way. Yeah, you can, you can stay here. I would say neither, because you can just write a reference implementation, throw it out there, and it's not your problem anymore. OK, so that would be another thing. But can you write a reference implementation of a, um, of a security policy for an organization? Not quickly. <laughs> not quickly. <laughs> OK. So actually, so that would be a third option that we don't have on here. But you could actually say, I mean, create a whatever, a program that implements your security policy, like what you're all doing, and then say whatever that program does is the security policy of this house. So if you ever have any questions, you just run a new simulation against that system. This happens a lot in, isn't Ruby done this way? Ruby is. Yeah, so Ruby, the language, doesn't, it must have some specification. No, nothing at all. Uh, OK, so they just have the Ruby interpreter that uh, Max, is it? Uh, the guy wrote, and that's whatever that does is what Ruby does, and anything else is like incorrect. So if you want to make a competing Ruby implementation, you better do it exactly the way the actual Ruby interpreter works. Whereas other languages like C++, Java have specifications for how they should work. And there's a lot of similarities here between what we're talking about here with security policies and computer languages. Um, is there a middle ground? Would we want a middle ground? Middle ground sounds great. So design it for me. What does it look like? Um, English descriptions that are always accompanied by numeric quantifiers to give specificity to the general overarching statement. OK, so maybe like a combination of some English with some formalisms. Maybe we can borrow, I can't remember who said it, but somebody mentioned set notation. We can maybe borrow symbols from there. We could do first order logic, some types of things. And then we could create essentially our own language. So we can create a policy language to express security policies in. And then what, is, what benefits does that have for us? Has this gotten us out of our trap? And one way to think of this is do we inherit the best of both worlds or the worst of both worlds? Worst of both worlds, how? So we have some, maybe there's something interesting here about um, we've added formalism to natural language, right? So now it's more difficult for people to express in what they actually want from their security policy. So we've added some formalism in this specific language. So now they need to learn this language. Uh, there actually exists a language called the XACML, I believe, which is like X, uh, access control list and access control specified in XML. So XML is like a data format language. It has all the things you can think about, uh, ands, ors, whatever, various conditionals, all this kind of stuff built into this policy language. So this is to be thinking about how to define security policies. And then we go to this question of, well, how do we tell if a security policy is correct? So we kind of at the start of this discussion talked a little bit about, well, we just say that, you know, whatever, we mathematically prove that it's correct. But I mean, is that easy? What are other ways and other things? How do we go about proving that a security policy is correct? Yeah. Try to break it. We can try to break it so we can prove that it's incorrect. Right? So similar actually to a mathematical proof of proof by, actually I can't remember what it's called, counterexample? No, it's not. Contradiction. There we go. Yeah. Uh, similar in that sense where we can, if we can show one counterexample where the system or the policy is not secure, then that would be a way to show that. Uh, what if we can't come up with a counterexample? Does that mean that it's secure? Not necessarily. No. Not necessarily? Why? If you wanted to prove it was secure, you need to show that for any case, it would still be true. Yeah, so just because we're not, maybe we're not smart enough to prove the counterexample, right? It could be that the counterexample exists, we just can't find it. 
right? The fact that we can't find it doesn't actually prove necessarily anything. So this could be a good way to disprove something. Yeah, somebody else is doing it. simple system, we could maybe try to exhaust all possibilities, maybe essentially brute force the security, improve the security. Um, what kind of assumptions do we make? So do we care about assumptions here? So like even thinking about the assignment, what kind of assumptions are being made? There? We made no assumptions? Yeah. Yeah, so we're assuming some parts of like the, the, the people check. There's somebody else back there. Put their hand up. Yeah. We left firefighters in, but we assume that we don't have any policemen. Yeah, so we assume we have firefighters, but not policemen, right? So we have we assume that the let's say I'd say maybe another way to put that, we assume that the policy is complete in what our intentions are, right? So we have the person who wrote this security policy had some intention of making this secure. But maybe that maybe they forgot right about policemen. So yeah, police people. Yeah. We assume there's no other way to force anybody to the outside without changing the lock or going through it. Yeah, or maybe trying a bunch of keys until somebody gets one and just magically guesses it correctly, right? So you could like what brute force? What if the key is just foo? Like, you could easily guess that, or if the key was password or something, right? Yeah. Yep. We assume the person making. We assume the person making the policy is trustworthy. Yeah, that's great. I, in this case, you can assume they're definitely not trustworthy. Uh, so we assume, right, the and this is what we're talking about. We assume the policy is correct, right? So we assume that the policy correctly expresses the intentions of the person developing it, right? When we talk about threat modeling, we talk about all of those cases. What else do we assume? So we talked, actually touched on it a little bit. We assume, at least in this house, there's no windows that somebody could break in and get into the house, right? So a good assumption, we talk about that a little bit, yeah. We're assuming only one person goes in at a time? Yeah, we're assuming that there's a magic device that prevents people from, two people from going out of a door at one time. Maybe an insanely smart door, but still, right? And all of these actually are ways where we're putting our trust and we're assuming that the mechanism is correctly implementing the policy, right? We're also assuming that this smart lock system we didn't get from somebody and it has a hard-coded uh, key in it. Why would uh, somebody do that? Or why would a manufacturer do that, let's say? Yeah? Like law enforcement reasons, maybe? Maybe they have their own thing, so maybe they have a key that they've shared with law enforcement. Yeah, what else? Yeah, in the back. Initial setup. Say again? Initial setup. Initial setup, right? When you first install your lock, it's a super smart lock, and you just turn it on, and it just auto locks, right? Does this ever happen in home, at home? Anybody ever set up a Wi-Fi router? What happens when you first set it up? Yeah, usually, I mean, newer ones are slightly better, but it used to be it was just like admin, admin, or you look up a list of what are the standard username and passwords of Wi-Fi routers, right? So you plug it in, the Wi-Fi network turns on, you connect to it and just log into this device with a hard-coded username and password. Uh, so that's clearly for ease of use, for you starting up, right, using that device right now. Um, there's also cases where people have found inside the firmware of the device that routers have hard-coded username and passwords that you can't change. And they want those for the same reasons that we just talked about. Actually, one thing is uh, remote administration. So they can actually go in and maybe fix problems with your router when you call them for tech support help. It's terrifying. Right? So this is, so this is, these are things to help you think about even if you've, whatever, mathematically proven, you've gone through all, you've brute forced all the use cases, you've used a theorem prover, whatever. You've proved that this is security policy correctly uh, invokes your safety uh, policies or whatever, or uh, matches your safety requirements. 
you still have to deal with these facts of is the policy itself even correct and do the mechanisms actually correctly implement this policy? These are constantly things that we're thinking about. And it really comes back to trust. So who do you trust? Firefighters. The firefighters, yeah, there's inherent trust. Why is understanding who you trust in this scenario important? Yeah. In this specific scenario, regardless of who they are, if they have the key, they can get it. Yeah, so you're trusting that you've given the fire, your local fire department that key, you're trusting that nobody there has made a duplicate of that key, that nobody there is secretly a criminal and is gonna use that key to break into your house when you're not home, right? So there's trust there. and it's. A, and why is it important to think about these avenues of trust? <clears throat> yeah. So that's like where the loss can be. Like you trust someone to not give your key out and they give it out, that's where you break the policy, I guess. Yeah, so this is where the policy can completely fail, right? We can have a perfect policy, but here we've trusted this human element. And if we don't even realize that we're trusting that the firefighters aren't going to share this key, right? Then we could completely, um, that could completely undermine the security of our system. But at least if we're aware of it, right, we can, what, what kind of things could we do to increase our trust in that process or that aspect of the system? <coughs> You can know and write down exactly who in the fire department you gave it to, so that in case anything happens, you have somebody to go to for recourse. Yeah, what else? Yeah. So you can include their badge number. That way, if you uh, if they do give it out to someone else, uh, when they're entering the, the key, they also have to enter their badge number, so you know who the culprit was that gave out the information. Great. So maybe then we change our policy of rather than having a hard coded key. We have a key with the prefix of, of that key and then a suffix of um, their badge number so that we have some, maybe some audit or some logs that can point to who actually used that. Yeah. Um, it would also be nice to see the security of the fire station. Maybe we want to audit the fire department, right? And say, okay, before I give you this key and trust you with my key, well, what safeguards do you have in place, right? You could look at their security policy. You can look at their security mechanisms, right? which could all increase your assurance and your trustworthiness of how you think about this aspect. So then you can say, okay, I know I have this element where I'm trusting the fire department in here, but I've gone through all these steps and I've increased my level of assurance that this is an acceptable risk to the system. Yeah, this was cool. I can't believe we're picking on fire people, but it's an important thing to think about. Cool, okay, so what kind of mechanisms have we been talking about here? So we talk about mechanisms, right? Mechanisms um, can are used to kind of actually be the things that enforce the policy, let's say, or maybe one way of phrasing it. So what types of mechanisms are you to draw wrong? Yeah, so maybe like a physical, like a physical device that has like a key card access or a sensor. Yeah, what else? I'm thinking broadly beyond this one or one now. Yeah, it's fun to focus on that. Yeah. For an example, I was wondering, um, so like to give a security protocol to melt firefighters that are reliable, mm -hmm. but any mechanism or policy? If it's like a system in place to tell you if they're, if they're reliable. It would be a mechanism. So the, the idea would be if there's some protocol, so let's say your smart lock system has a way to connect back to the fire department system, so they can, maybe before they leave to go to your house, they hit some button or something that says, yes, we're gonna use this key maybe in the next 30 minutes or something, and so your lock has a way to ask that. So yeah, that, um, that mechanism, that, or that, yes, that protocol and everything would be a mechanism. The policy aspect would be like, before you leave, you have to hit this button that says you're gonna use this key in the next 30 minutes or something, right? And then you may need override mechanisms, so you may need all kinds of other aspects, yeah. So we have very roughly, like, you can think of it in terms of like technical mechanisms, right? Um, and, I don't know, this is that works. 
So, so what do we want out of a security mechanism? So what makes a security mechanism effective? So think about, uh, let's say, securing a door of the things we've been talking about, right? Are they all, all locks considered equal? No? What about bike locks? Mm, some people have their bikes stolen, maybe. <laughs> no, that all locks are not created equal. Why? Yeah. So you don't always have access to the game from the lock. Like for a bike lock, you can only have a chain code attached to it, but for like a door lock, you can't just like go like one side of the door. Maybe. It depends on the door, right? I mean, it depends if you can maybe slide a credit card in to open the thing, depending on how, like, which way the lock actually goes. It also depends on if it's a deadbolt versus just a regular, right? So a deadbolt is a lock actually slides into place. I don't even know what the other kind is called, but the other type of just door lock that, off, depending on what side of the door you're on, you could maybe um, pop open with a credit card even. Um, what are other types of, I don't know, door locks that are more secure? Yeah? Pin codes? Pin codes? Yeah, so maybe a pin number that Like if you look, I mean I won't show you close enough so you can take a picture, but uh, if you look at like, uh, like my home lock looks very not as complicated as like a door lock in ASU. Um, like I don't know, actually I actually have no idea the difference. I'm also not a lock expert, so don't quote me on all this stuff. Uh, the mailbox to my, my home mailbox has like much less complexity to it than the other ones, right? So these all increase the difficulty of either picking the lock or trying to make a counterfeit or make a bump key or do any of these other kinds of crazy stuff, right? Um, and that's not to say we didn't even talk about pin code lock, so a lock that you actually don't have a key to, but you know some numeric digit that you type in. Um, we didn't talk about, let's say, the locks on a prison are quite different than the locks on your home. Do you agree? I hope so for all of your sakes. <laughs> so yeah, so what's the difference between all these things? Like what, when you think about the effectiveness of, of a security mechanism, so we talked a little bit about like, in some sense, so uh, we talked about the pins and how many pins there are in a lock, right? That could affect the effectiveness of the lock mechanism based on how easy it is to break that. Uh, but then what's the difference between that and let's say cutting a lock on a bike? Yeah, so you were mad about that? I was going to say the risk of what happens if information or the body is stolen. Ooh, interesting. Okay, so yeah, so uh, in both cases we're talking about, in one way we're talking about how easy is it to bypass this mechanism, right? If, uh, let's say those two doors in the back there, if one was open and the other one was locked, and I had a super fancy lock on one door, but not on the other, it would be a very ineffective security mechanism because it could be easily bypassed. Uh, similarly, on a bike lock, if, the, if it's easy to just cut through with, uh, so wire cutters? No, what are those called? Bolt cutters, there we go, yeah. If it's easy to cut through the, whatever, the lock chain itself, that's a big problem. If it's easy to cut through the lock itself that way, that's another problem, right? So we want to think about how secure are these, and that's maybe a poor choice of words, but um, in some sense, how secure is this mechanism, right? How easily bypassable is it? How effective is it at implementing what we want it to do? Another thing we want to think about is, so, So another thing to think about is, would it be, let's say my security policy is uh, whatever. We'll talk about the room because I'm thinking about doors now. But let's say I hauled in a giant rock that was the size of those doors and put it in front of the doors. And says I'm now implementing a policy where uh, you can like basically like a lock on the door. Does that like prevent people from coming in? Yes, yeah. Is it like a round rock? Like if you push it, will it start rolling in? Let's say it's so big, it's like bigger than that door, so there's no possible way it's on the outside. So 
Yeah. Is it only on that set of doors, or is it on every single? It's on every side. It's blocked all doors. Yeah. Does it compromise access? Yeah. So in that case, the you'd say maybe that the security mechanism is not very precise in what it allows or disallows. So it may be. Uh, matches one set of my security policy, right? It's saying that, okay, people can't access it, but it doesn't actually allow a way for people to not get access. So you can think about it, security mechanisms in terms of how precise it is, how broad is that security mechanism, is it easily bypassable? These are all great things that you're all thinking about. So don't put rocks, don't use rocks when the lock will do, I guess. Okay, cool. So assurance, so this is, one of the words in the title of this course. So is this an important concept or a not unimportant concept? Yeah. What do you care? You're just here to get grades. <laughs> so what does assurance mean? So I've tried, I've used it a few times, which is kind of difficult because we're still in an overview. Yeah. Uh, guarantee of trust. Ooh, guarantee of trust. Can you ever guarantee trust in something? Not 100%, but what about with the mathematical proof? What if I've proven something to you? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe I give you this proof that this thing is trustworthy, secure, correct. Um, one area this comes up in is they made progress on doing um, formally verified, actually, an entire operating system. Do you remember the name of it? It's something Linux. It's some S, not SE Linux, but um, anyways, there's a, an operating system that they have mathematically verified <coughs> satisfies certain security properties, right? So they have to model all the functions and they have ways to analyze the code and use theorem provers to actually prove it, so it spits out this proof that says, yes, this system is secure. Um, the question, though, is, again, should you trust that system 100%? No, why? You're shaking your head no. It's easy to say no. So who wrote the specifications, right? So you have to s prove something is correct against the specification, right? So who wrote that specification? Were the specifications correct? How do you then, so you prove that the operating system matches the specification, but a human had to write the specifications. So how do you prove that the human's intention of what should be secure is exactly what that specification says? Yeah. Yeah, building on the technology, like computers are getting faster, obviously, every year. So the like if you have a proof for a password or something, it might not be as valid today as it might have been like 10 years ago. Yeah, so proof, uh, let's say that's a good, so let's say technology improves, so attackers' capabilities get better. Uh, what if they attack a part of the system that was outside of your model? Um, so anybody heard of Spectre Meltdown? Yeah, so most operating systems give you a very clean separation, let's say, between a process where one process can't read another process's memory space, which is great because otherwise you'd have your apps like stealing each other's username and passwords, all that kind of stuff. Essentially, um, at a high level, um, Spectrum Meltdown broke down some of this and used at a very low level of the chip, the uh, branch prediction ability of the actual hardware device to leak data through like a tiny side channel from one process to another. And so you could like people, you could use it to leak the entire memory pages of, anyways, it's insane. We'll probably maybe go into a more in depth at a later point, but the point remains for a lot of applications and secure applications, this was outside their threat model. They didn't under, they didn't never considered this possibility. So you could have had a system that was proven 100% correct, but now they've changed fundamentally something that you didn't model in your system. And so how could you ever think that that was 100% secure? So it's very easy to, uh, to think that, but so, okay. So then the alternative is, do we just give up? So I just hopefully convince you that you can't ever 100% trust things. So does that, that mean that you should never trust anything? 0% trust. Yeah. You, you 
we have to trust in things or else you just live your life with full of insecurities. But you'll, you'll have to admit that it might get broken at some point and just learn to live with that, I guess. Yeah, so maybe like you don't think, um, to rephrase, right? You don't think necessarily that anything is 100% secure, but assume, think that things will get compromised? Yeah. Trust but verify. Trust but verify. So uh, do you do that with your operating system? No. Right. So when can you do that? Let's say that. That's an interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> so the many eyes argument. Uh, yeah. So you may be saying, well, this was an open source, whatever. Linux. I'm sure people have looked at this. There must not be any security problems. Yeah. So you can at least verify that it hasn't been tampered, right? But can you verify that it's secure? Like, do you trust it? Right? Yeah. If, like, an example, you make an API call, you can verify um, the data you get back before you use it, even if it says it's perfect. So yeah, maybe you can do, depending on your app or something, you can do more validation layers on top of things. Yeah. I guess with a lot of companies and organizations that make software that consumers use, they're really precious uh, software to that company. So they're proprietary, they don't release their code. So a lot, a lot of times we can't actually verify what we are using to secure and handling our information correctly. Right, but maybe you can, right? So that's part of it. I mean, I think all of these are different. It's not a yes or no binary, you trust it or don't trust it, right? You may say, on one hand, you'd say, well, uh, whatever, Microsoft Windows, like, yeah, I can't access the source code of it, but I know Microsoft is a huge team that's dedicated to security, and if I regularly patch, maybe I'll stay moderately up to date. Uh, you could then also think, well, maybe Linux has tens or hundreds of open source developers. I'm sure they're not making any problems, and I can, I always could look at the code, even though I don't check the vulnerabilities. Um, you could try to find vulnerabilities yourself in the system, so that can be part of the verify, which you can do even if you don't have the source code, which is much more difficult. <coughs> Uh, why assume that you have to trust it at all? Just don't trust it and only trust it with what you're willing to put at risk. So assume that there is risk and then only trust it with the things you're willing to put at risk. So then maybe what we're missing here is then this notion of, let's say, risk or trustworthiness in some sense. So if you had, if you could quantify it in some sense to say, well, I trust this. Uh, I have data that's this level of sensitive, and I trust this system that's more than that. So I'll put that down on that system otherwise. So you can think of companies um, have this now with, they don't allow you to put you know, company data on your own personal smartphone, or you're not supposed to. You're supposed to use a company-owned and controlled device, so that, that way they have some level of insurance in that device. Um, yeah, so actually this great, brings up a great point. So can we quantify it? Can we come up with these numbers of trusts and risk and all this? Uh, let's go there. Yeah. Our numbers probably know what we can, we know that storing certain data is more sensitive than others. So we have all social security numbers, whatever information. Um, we have to be in the compliance, but it's something about an event date to allow us to do Yeah, so, okay, so at least Especially maybe with data we control, that's a lot easier. Maybe to quantify risk in some sense, right? Of how sensitive is this data, how important is this data, all those kind of things. What about on the other side? On the securing system side. Yeah. Can you say that we test, we can test the system with this amount of like attempted entries to say what is the success delta rate? So maybe there are, and there are some ways you can do this, right? So there's, uh, let's say, what's the name of the SSL testing stuff? Do you know offhand? Um, so there's the HTTPS all uses secure encrypted communication, but there's, it's a negotiated process of what protocols are used, and some protocols have known weaknesses. So there's a site, I can't remember, it's like SSL something that, looks at a bunch of sites and grades them based on how well and what crypto properties their uh, cypher suites allow. 
Um, so if you look on there, they're trying to convince people to upgrade the security of those from like an F rating to an A rating, right? So that could be one way to quantify that. But you know, when you think about, well, how do I quantify in that way the operating system, right? So like, I can run all the tests I want. I mean, if I find a, a something that crashes the Mac kernel or something, then I would be very, very, very happy. But I likely it won't, I will find nothing. But is that still, you know, then how do I quantify that, right? How do I, do I say, and how much of my insurance, assurance and trust in that system rise up just because I couldn't find anything? Yeah. Um, I think, like, you can't quantify our number for the most part, but you can quantify our relative, speaking. So, like, let's say you have, like, max, like, max, like, max, like, two, mm -hmm. so you're going to have the operating system no matter what, like, you want to do your work. What about right now? What if I write now? Yeah, Ooh, it's going to be worse. <laughs> Challenge. So like, so you like stack the three and including yours of the like, um, if you stack them and you realize it has less money, you can go with that and you're still seeing the best one. Because you just go with the best one. But how do you rank those? I mean, I mean, so like, how do you rank Like, I have at least like empirically, like, like, have they been reached before and how many times did they, were there security factors that they publish on the code? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you could try to make that determination. But then you have the key problem with a lot of these things of that Windows still have like an 80% market share or something crazy. So are attackers really like bad guys focusing their time and effort on Windows and opposed to Mac? And it also gets into threat modeling, right? How, wor how worried are you that somebody is targeting you and your organization so it doesn't actually matter which one you choose, they will find something in there versus how you're just worried about being one of the general people that's hit by the next thing. Yeah, so you definitely can, but there are, but uh, we'll get into crypto, right? But there are subtle ways that crypto can fail that looks correct, but on closer inspection is actually just bogus and wrong, which may be difficult to know from the out, on, outside, right? Or from just a cursory glance. Cool, this is a great, um, so yeah, I pose this not as a question of telling you it can or it can't. I think this is all important things to think about. I mean, if you could, and this is actually the, I'd say probably one of the biggest problems right now in security in the sense of if you come up with some product to be able to take a system and quantify trust in it, uh, you could, and you, I'm sure you can convince a lot of businesses to give you a lot of money, assuming it actually works. Um, the problem is actually creating that number, right? Because you have companies that say, that try to answer this question. Well, how much, I have sensitive data, what do I put it on? How much effort do I put into, like, so you're a uh, chief information security officer, you go to the CEO and you say, we need $10 million in order to secure whatever, our new data center, our new product. And they go, great, how much more secure is that gonna get us than if I give you zero dollars? And you go, uh, more? Whereas in other areas of business, right, if you go to marketing, they can say, well, you give us $5 million and we'll be able to empirically show you that we'll be able to create sales up to here, right? I can calculate the return on investment you'll get from giving me that $5 million or that $10 million. Where in security, we just say, well, it's gonna be more secure. Hopefully, I mean, you're not gonna say it's gonna be less secure. Cool, so what does assurance depend on? We've been hitting a lot of, of different things that it can depend on. What other things? So we talked about maybe if we have access to the source or not. Cases do you have? Uh, what's your testing procedure like? So we could maybe talk with, and if we're a big customer, that actually could maybe get us pretty far. What else? Yeah. Do you say it a little louder? Right. So in what way? So you can use maybe your own uh, 
knowledge and power in order to, um, to try to help verify that, right? So you could use, and you could use what's publicly known, right? So we went into like quantification a little bit of like public exploits. You could see like, whatever, you're gonna buy a new bike lock. You could look on YouTube. This bike lock like bypass, and you can see things where they just stick a big pen in the side of a bike lock, and it pops the bike lock open. Right, so you'd say, hmm, maybe this is not an effective way to spend my money because it's trivially bypassable, right? I have zero insurance in this system. Or maybe you'd look at what was the last incident that happened to this company and how did they respond, right? Were they very hostile and hiding details or were they very open and transparent about exactly what went on, right? Yeah, please. Sometimes even the state of the art gets wrong. Thinking about no cryptographic system being actually secure the way that it's set. Yeah, so that's great. Yeah, and that's all about thinking about your threat models, right? And thinking through, well, I mean, I don't know if everybody's getting this wrong, then there's not much you can do about it, right? But yeah, that's definitely a risk and something you need to think about that can impact your assurance of a system. How long do we go? 115. 115? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's been a long time. It's been like a week since I was up here teaching. So, and one of the things we can look at with assurance is, so let's say, let's put ourselves in the mindset of now we're developing, we'll keep it in software because that's what I know best, um, but we're developing some piece of software. We want, we, do we want it to be secure? Yes, no, maybe, I don't know, who cares? Maybe? Yes. Yeah, so we want it to be secure. So should we just develop everything and then at the end ask the question of is this piece of software secure? No. no. How long does it take to develop a piece of software? How long can it? Years. years. Yeah, it could take years to develop this piece of software. Right? So do you want to wait two years before you figure out that actually this design you did was fundamentally flawed and you need to go back to the drawing board and start all over? What happens at that point? Yeah, people say like, uh, just put whatever bank you can do on it and ship it because uh, we've spent too much money on this anyways. Right? So this is why it's important to think about the entire software development life cycle and this is, again, we'll talk about very high levels. There's whatever, you can get pretty in depth in this, water file, waterfall, agile, different types. But at each point you need some notion of the first step, which is like the specification. So at a high level, what does the specification mean? So it just, it's, it's not tricky. It doesn't have to be, you know, we're not talking necessarily specification documentation, but if you're developing some piece of software, you must have some notion of what it should do, right? Otherwise, you're just sitting there at a keyboard just typing random things, which could be fun in its own right. I mean, that's totally fine. Um, but assuming you are asking the question of, what is the software supposed to do? So how do we define that? Or how is the specification, can it be defined? Yeah. Um, like a UML diagram? So you could have a um, fancy, like a UML diagram that, I would say this actually maybe fits in more to the next part because, it, I mean, a UML diagram can get into that a little bit, but it's more on the how to construct all the pieces so that they properly talk to each other, right? But it's less about the what should it do so how do you define what to do? Yeah. Document, natural language, right? It could just, or it could be an email, or it could be whatever. You can get whatever, Trello board, Agile has like user stories, all this kind of stuff, right? So uh, there's different ways of specifying the specification. Could you like mathematically model and define exactly what you want your program to do? Yeah, you could do that. I mean, that's totally reasonable. Um, you can do that. So what should we be thinking about here at the specification stage in order to increase our assurance of a system? Should we or should we wait? Yeah. I was going to say we should just like maybe say what part of that spec does it only do what you say it's supposed to do or can it do other things? Yeah, so 
So what type of things? Okay, so yes, we do want to do this, right? Because actually fixed right now, the only thing that exists is either in our mind or in the Word document. Is it easier to change a Word document than a program? Yeah. Yes, you've all written papers? Like text, papers? And you've written programs and have bugs in those programs? Is it easier to change a sentence in a paper than it is to uh, change your program from uh, whatever, an array of a linked lists the day before the deadline? <laughs> yes. Right? So changing it here can be a lot easier and a lot cheaper in terms of business. Right? So what kind of things do we want to think about then for the specification? Yeah? Uh, like target audience of who's allowed to use the software? Yeah, so we may need to think through, this is where we can kind of bring in the notion of security policy, right? And all the things we talked about of, well, what, what is it actually, we can ask the question, what does it actually mean for the system to be secure, right? So at this point, we kind of have a notion of what the, what the system should do and how can we make sure that it's actually secure or what does secure mean in this context, right? And then we can start drilling down to access, who should be accessing what, uh, what type of information is sensitive here? If we say, well, we'll just have uh, whatever, a list of all of our employees' uh, names and social security numbers on our public website, at that moment, you could maybe stop and say, hey, whoa, 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 that's sensitive information. We should maybe think about securing that. What else? Yeah. The environment that's going to be in. The environment that it's going to be in. So we can start thinking forward to being, okay, this is the specification. Where is it going to live? How are we going to test? that environment, how are we going to make sure that what we've actually deployed is what is, uh, so we can be thinking through and planning at this stage. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah. How it's interacted with, like, is it, how it's interacted with, is it just a terminal and based on the internet? Right, yeah, so thinking through um, attack surface, like we talked about, right, as part of threat modeling. So you can go through threat modeling here to say what are all the threats against this, where is this located, is it a terminal in a secure facility, or is it a website that's accessible from literally anyone on Earth? Right? So all of those impact the security of the system and how we need to think about it. Great. So what's next? So we've had a specification. Now what do we do? Design. What's the difference between design and implementation? Design is high level. Not coding. Yeah, these are kind of roughly, again, and it's, um, it's kind of the, in some sense, a tragedy of undergrad computer science education is the assignments you work on are not really big enough that you need to do these as part of separate steps. Uh, but even then, while you're writing code, you may be, and this can be intertwined in some sense because oftentimes you don't actually know what the design should be until you've tried it out in one way and failed completely. Um, but here we can design it. What kind of things can we design? Say again? Hexagonal. Hexagonal in one sense. Well, clean design. Yeah, okay. So we can yeah, so we can design the code, we can make sure that the structure is clean, we can make sure that it's easily extensible in the future. Um, yeah, what else? Yeah. Specific with like diagrams, topologies. Yeah, we can look this where the UML comes in, maybe we kind of structure our and model our code so that it's can be a little bit more clean. Any other things? Yeah. Network. Say louder. Network. Yeah, so we maybe want to design, depending on where and what our system is, we may want to design, okay, what are the different pieces? How do they talk to each other over the network? How are they going to live? Right? Uh, we may think at this stage about UI. What's the interface look like? Is it a command line application? Is it a website? Is it an app? Um, all these different things. And so now, what's the key question? That we, so now, can we do any security analysis here? Can we do anything to increase our assurance that we'll get something secure at the end? Good, so we can look ahead and we can see, okay, well we're writing this in C. Uh, buffer overflow is the most common vulnerability and here's a list of other vulnerabilities, so maybe we can implement good coding practices uh, to 
before we ever start actually writing code, so that, that way we can prevent these types of things. Um, yeah, it's a good uh, good option. What else? Uh, yeah. Would you consider TypeScript development design or more implementation? Yeah, that's tricky. Um, I don't know. Some things don't fit cleanly into these models. I think kind of depends, I guess, on exactly where you do it. You could say test-driven development is like a way to implement. Um, but you could decide to use that in this design stage. Maybe could you say we can have security tests right as part of our test-driven development. Um, so that would be good to have in there. You can think of, uh, I was talking with, I think it was a guy from Allstate who was thinking about how to do like security include development as part of the develop, uh, sorry, the, how to add security to the development process through things like that, through having automated security test cases, uh, these kind of things. So yeah, you can definitely think about those things here. And you could say, what do these things do to increase our assurance that the system will be secure? Anything else? Right? So we can look at like, okay, we, what type of things do we need at different points in the system? Um, how does this relate to the specification? Are we just in a completely new territory and area now? specification, we said, okay, here's the assumptions, here's the threats that we're facing, but if the specification says you need like an app and the design says we're going to make a website, I mean, that's a clear example where something is um, not matching up, right? Could we prove that the design satisfies the specification? Yes. Yes? How? Cool. So what would you need to do that if you want to answer that? So what would you need to do that? So you maybe could do that if you have a way to match specification design. Okay, so yeah, we need maybe, and to maybe get there, right, we need some kind of formalism in the specification, formalism in the design, a way to map them back and forth. Um, you could even do maybe some cool stuff where you take the specification, you do natural language processing to kind of try to extract some high-level rules that you then use to compare against the design, maybe in the form of a UML diagram, so you can kind of see what those things could be. Um, so then we go to everyone's favorite part, or maybe not, I don't know. Really, doesn't really matter. Uh, so, implementation. So, what's the implementation part? Actually, Yeah, actually, like getting something to do what your design says it should do and the specification says it should do, right? This is like what y'all have been working on for the last couple of years of how to actually do this. So, how do we actually implement the design? So implementing it, writing code, is that the only way to do it? Not necessarily. Not necessarily? But there's some like, tools where you can just like, drag the blocks around. Yeah, so maybe you could actually like auto-generate the implementation or some version of it based on the design, which would be pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, you know, I mean, thinking through these kind of things. And then from a security question, right, we want to ask, does the implementation satisfy the design? 
How do we tell that? Test cases, yeah, maybe we create test cases, right? So um, I will caution us, unless the test cases are, let's say, so in general, what are, what are test cases for? Or what does testing usually test? Unit so unit testing, so it's testing maybe like a function, but what's, what's the high level thing that it is testing? What was it? The behavior, what about the behavior? I mean, so programs behave, right? So what about it? Yeah. Like poking at a potential flaw in the program. Yeah. Okay. A potential flaw in what? Yeah. In the program logic, in the behavior, right? So you're looking for, is the program functionally correct in some sense, right? Are you actually testing that it's secure? What's the difference between the two? So this is actually one of the key things about security is that, I mean, a bug is just a bug until it compromises the security of an application, in which case now we're talking about a vulnerability in the application. So most testing is done in the sense of correctness. Does this match the specification or the design? So you need to go that extra step to actually test, like, is this secure in the face of a certain kind of vulnerability, which may be a completely different way of thinking about testing. So it's an important thing to keep in mind. Like if I told you I had 100% test uh, code coverage of an application, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's secure. It may mean it's functionally correct, but given malicious input, if I never tested on that, it could have uh, massive consequences. Cool. What other things do we do? To increase our insurance that the implementation is secure. You could yeah. deliberately put in malicious input to see how it responds to that. Yeah, so I may, I may, depending on the exact language and the bugs that I'm, classes I'm worried about, I may put in test cases. This is actually a really good way of uh, uh, finding security bugs and kind of like incorporating them into your development and testing lifecycle by creating test cases that are maybe deliberately insane. Now this doesn't mean that it's secure again, but it can increase your assurance that it's um, <coughs> somewhat resilient. Cool. And, and could we prove then that the implementation satisfies the design? I saw some heads nodding. How? Do we want to? Do we care to? design, you could maybe extract what things should do what, or what uh, we talked about UML. Like the UML diagram, you can actually verify that the code implements and does this correctly. So let's say we've done, we've done some of the things we've talked about here. Are we good, secure, we can go home? No, why not? It's not 115 yet, but <laughs> why else not? Hasn't been tested all the way. Yeah, hasn't been tested, what do you mean all the way? So good, so maybe we have blind spots because we developed it. This ever happened to you where you wrote some code, you're looking at it, you have no idea what the problem is, and then 
of course, this is not a class project, but you ask somebody else to look at it, and they point out immediately that you have a problem on this line that you never saw because you wrote the code. Yeah, so that's a great aspect. The other aspect is, did we ever actually test it of how it's really going to run? Right? At this point, what about deployment, configuration, operation? Right? How is this system configured? How is it deployed? Um, if we're running this on whatever, AWS, are our, our AWS buckets open to the world and we're leaking customer data? This is actually how, what company got hacked by that? What was it? Apple? Capital One, yes, there you go, thank you, sorry. That goes, it's a little. Um, yeah, Capital One got hacked because they, they, they got a bunch of uh, user account information leaked through AWS buckets that were set to be, or they hacked into them? I can't remember, but. And again, we want to ask the question, like, how is the implementation deployed? So even if we, whatever, you could say theoretically proven that the implementation is secure, you can still take that and deploy it in an environment that is not secure. Right? So we still want to think through how is the implementation deployed, configured, operated, and again, kind of how to prove this is a key problem. So I want to kind of shift gears a little bit. So I was kind of thinking through how we can apply this idea of threat modeling, um, assurance at, through the software development lifecycle. I want to talk a little bit because we're going to talk about all the different like uh, aspects of security. So, you know, this is something we've touched on a little bit, but are security measures worth the cost? When are they? When are they not? Are they always worth the same? this question from a business perspective if we lose this information are we going to get fined 200 million dollars or whatever it is right it's a pretty big incentive to do things um what else yeah well like ease of use like if you have your employees have like 10 factor authentication or something crazy and whenever they want to change their code it's a big mess <laughs> yeah 10, 10 factor authentication would be a lot of factors i think you've run out of factors at a certain point Maybe depend on the person, right? For these reasons, I mean, if you think about personal security, personal mechanisms, um, you'd want to think through all those things. But yeah, so these are uh, really good things. And this is actually, you know, one of the key things that, why we talk about business and business context, because these types of questions come up, right? Of like, okay, you want to implement some new thing, two-factor authentication, great. What's the cost-benefit analysis? What's it going to cost us to do that? in terms of both like monetary dollars to actually do this, plus uh, what's it gonna cost our employees when they get locked out of their account because they forgot their phone at home or something. Um, these are all important things to consider. Okay, so risk analysis. Like, should we protect things? Seems like a silly question. The answer should always be yes, right? Something in the security class. Is that true? Depends. Depends on what. It's like the answer to most things in this class. So <laughs> you have to actually back it up with reasoning. How much resources you could afford to spend on protecting things? Again, cost benefit analysis, right? So what's the risk of this system? What actually budget do we have to defend against those? Yeah. Great example. So yeah, yeah, you may, um, if the defense mechanism costs you more money than the asset itself is worth, so you have a $20 bike, would you buy a $50 bike lock to defend that bike? I don't know, it's up to you. Maybe, depends on how far you travel, if you really need that bike to get somewhere, yeah. Say louder, sorry. Ah, the reputation of the company. Yeah, yeah, that's a great example. Yeah. Likelihood of death. Yeah, the likelihood, right? So the risk, right? All these.
these things actually, um, you may not, let's say, don't buy a lock if you're able to keep your bike in your house and whatever, in a classroom or something. Well, don't keep your bikes in a classroom, but uh, if you can always keep them in a secure place, maybe you don't need a lock, right? Um, cool, what threats does it face? What are the consequences if it's attacked? This is an interesting point. Does risk remain constant? No, why not? Value changes over time, yeah. Do we talk about uh, corporate profit numbers? No? Does anybody know, like, companies quarterly release, public companies release their quarterly profit numbers? Is that information valuable? Yes. Yes, why? Because it's just What was it? Somebody, yeah. So if someone gets those numbers before they get released, you can sell your debt inside of the trade. Right, so the, so the stock will likely rise or fall based on how the actual numbers do against expectations. And whether you know it's gonna rise or fall, you can bet that way and make a lot of money, right? So think about the server that has a company's quarterly report earnings. The day before those numbers are to be released, is the value of that system very high? Yeah? What about the day, that, the day after the numbers are released? Nothing changed about that server. What was it? Nothing's changed. We haven't added any data to that system. It's the exact same system. Not really, right? Because that data is literally public at this point. So actually, I don't care if you get access to it, assuming everything is equal, right? So the, the, how the value to an attacker of that asset actually fluctuates over time, right? And so, of course, we may, and maybe we throw that machine away and get a new one or something, right? There's a lot of uh, things in there. Um, okay. Uh, first thing I want to talk about real quick. Oh, we have to get stuff three minutes. Would you put a microchip in your skin? Sure. What does it do? Thank you. Somebody <laughs> asked the good question. Some of your classmates just started yelling out yes or no. Um, so this is a really interesting news story. If you go check it out, it, ha it talks about, um, so instead of key cards, which you can lose, which sucks, the company will let you, uh, well not let you, I think forces you to put a microchip in your finger so that you can like badge in and out of the buildings and then pay for food and stuff in the company store. So what do you think, are you on board with this? Only if it's open source, says Max. <laughs> to give a microchip as long as he has the code. He'll be, yeah. Why don't you like it? Invasion of privacy? But why? I don't want to lose a finger so somebody can give me something. Losing a finger so if somebody wants to get in the building, they'll chop off your finger? All right. Let's continue this on Thursday. I like this. Come with your microchips. <laughs>